Welcome to the third week of the Good Book Club and our study of the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 7, and we've traveled with Mark long enough that it's very likely that you have begun to notice a couple of recurring themes that I want to I hit the pause button, so to speak, and, and address them and, and talk a little bit about what they mean. And, and, and while these are two separate ideas, there, there is a strange irony when you hold these two themes up together. The first is how the disciples seem to be clueless to what's going on. I mean, they may be following Jesus, but the more that they follow Him, the more confused they seem to become. I remember as a young child, and I would come home from school, and there was this one channel that had these old black and white silent movies of a group called the Keystone Cops. And they were known for their slapstick comedy that that focused in on their incompetence. And they're always kind of bumbling and fumbling around. And and I always kind of think of that group as I read about the disciples and how they are portrayed in in Mark's gospel. While, While the other gospels do at times report the disciples as confused, it's only Mark that does so with a regularity and emphasis that kind of makes us wonder. So much so that it's, it's like it's a theme for Mark, and it will play out even more and more as we approach the crucifixion. So if you have time, skim back over the first eight chapters and, and highlight the verses where these things occur. Do you see a trend? And you're going to see this theme very clearly this week in, in chapter 8. I mean, just kind of listen to the exasperation when, when Jesus says something to the effect of the disciples, do you still not get it? Do you still not understand? Do, do you have eyes but you fail to see and ears that fail to hear? And juxtapose that to the focus of how many of the miracles that are reported in Mark deal with opening of the eyes and, and opening of the ears. And do you remember when Jesus said back in chapter 4, let those with ears hear? Now, now, just after this episode, Jesus then opens the eyes of a blind man. And the next we come to what is literally the, the midpoint of Mark's gospel in Mark 8, 27 through 9, 1. Read that as a unit. Here's the familiar story of what I like to call to Jesus' day that He gave a pop test. It, he kind of turns around and begins with this question, Who do people say that I am? And, and then it turns personal. But who do you say that I am? I would contend that for Mark, this is not just another story. This is the story. And I say that because of the way that this question fits into Mark's focus on Jesus as the Messiah. Remember all the way back at the beginning. So this question, who do you say that I am, is the question And just after that, in Mark 8.32, we we are told that that Jesus begins to teach them plainly or openly, depending on your translation. And and the original Greek, it it might be better translated that He told them boldly. It's the only time in Mark where we hear that phrase, and what Jesus tells them boldly is what being a Messiah is truly about. Not to mention what being a follower of the Messiah is all about. And this is the first of three times that that Jesus will talk about His imminent suffering and death and how that is a part of being the Messiah. But there's a second reason I think that this story is pivotal for Mark. It's at the very midpoint of the Gospel, as I told you. And last week I suggested to you that when we read Mark, I mean, think of it as kind of a Broadway show. And with that in mind, imagine that we have just arrived at the intermission I mean, just imagine this dramatic moment. And truly, I tell you, some of you are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God has come with power. The curtain closes, the lights come up, and then after the intermission, we return in chapter 9, verse 2. We open with the story, this grand and magnificent story of the transfiguration, but it begins with, and six days later connecting it back to the first act. And still, they're afraid and confused after all of this. Now now put that first theme about the disciples aside, and and let's turn to the second theme that has been called by scholars the the Messianic secret. In short, it is the, the string of verses 
through Mark that repeat this kind of refrain for, for people to, to keep the secret of the good news that they experience and encounter in Jesus. Again and again, Jesus puts a lid on things. He silences demons, hushes the people. And some of the most powerful healings He does in private, away from the people. And yet the more that Jesus tries to keep things quiet, the more people want to shout and share. I mean, who, who wants to keep this a secret, this good news? And you will see that very clearly in chapter 7. Again, as time permits, go back over the first eight chapters and look for these ideas. So, so here's the irony of these two themes. Isn't it odd that on one hand Jesus is telling people to, to not share the good news, to keep it a secret? But He's angry with His closest friends and disciples who are unable to get the good news? I mean, what's going on? Well, I'd like to offer to you at least two ways to interpret these themes. One is from a literal viewpoint. In other words, this is what happened. The disciples were clueless. Jesus tells people to hush. And maybe He does so, so that He will not be confused with a political Messiah or a warrior type of Messiah. Maybe it's because Jesus does not want to be arrested too soon. Or that Jesus realizes how people can become enamored by miracles and they miss out on the greatest miracle. The, the second way to come at these ideas is it's not so much from a, a literal viewpoint, but from a literary one. What, what I mean is that, that all four of the Gospels writers have a slant. We've talked about that before. They're not just recording events, but they are addressing a particular community. That They are interpreting the stories to their people. So these, these two ideas may not have literally happened, but they are the ways that, that Mark is interpreting the good news for his church. In other words, he's preaching. So I want to ask you to imagine with me that we're back in Mark's time. We're members of Mark's church in Rome where a lot of people think that maybe he lived. Emperor Nero has just put the blame of the burning of Rome on us and on our church. People, our friends are, and family are being arrested for their love of Jesus. And we've just received word that the temple in Jerusalem, Jerusalem was breached by soldiers and destroyed. The first generation of disciples are dying off. There are plagues and earthquakes. The world is falling apart, and Jesus has not come back. It feels like the world is falling apart. So we show up on Sunday, and Mark presents this entire gospel. And in it you find the pastoral message that it's okay if you're having a hard time believing, just look at the hard time the disciples had. If you're confused, it's okay. They were too. If you're doubting, it's okay. They doubted too. And don't focus too much on the miracles. The real power of Jesus is, is found in the suffering and in the cross. That is the miracle. And because of that, know that your suffering today is, is a part of your faith. It does not mean that Jesus has forsaken you. Trust in God. Believe. So, so there you have it. A literal viewpoint and an, a, a literary viewpoint. And if you're a good Episcopalian, you might even say that the answer is somewhere in the middle. I, I know I did not go verse by verse and scene by scene this week, but, and we're going to return to so the stories of the Syrophoenician woman and the healing of the blind man next week, because I wanted to look at another theme in Mark and the way that he weaves together this drama and these stories. I'm recording this reflection on the morning of January 7th, the day after the, the terrible news out of our capital, and a week before you will actually watch it. I have no idea what the next week will bring. So rather than a question for you to ponder, I want to invite you to consider composing a prayer, your prayer, given this week's readings, whatever's going on in your world when you watch this, 
Might you write a prayer to pray? Is it a plea for sight or a deeper understanding? Is it for strength in a time of suffering? Is it a simple thank you for life? Or maybe it's a desire to know what God wants you to do. What does it mean to take up the cross in your life? Write it down on a piece of paper. Put it in the pages of your Bible. Let us pray. This is another day, O Lord. I know not what it will bring forth, but make me ready. Make me ready, Lord, for whatever it may be. If I am to stand up, help me to stand bravely. If I am to sit still, help me to sit quietly. If I am to lie low, help me to do it patiently. And if I am to do nothing, let me do it gallantly. Make these words more than words, and give me the Spirit of Jesus. Amen.